Okay, uh, <clears throat> also today, uh, which is uh, May 11th, 2023, we'll talk about um, this uh, very interesting uh, Italian architect, Leonardo Savioli. Uh, let's uh, read a, a little bit about him. But before we read a little bit about him, let's uh, look at a few pictures with him uh, as a young man. Unfortunately, he died uh, approximately young. He could have lived longer. I think at 65 or 67, he died. Um, Leonardo Sabioli. And here he is in his older age. Uh, he was also a painter a painter and an architect, an architect and a painter, which comes first. Uh, apparently, he was very um, influenced by uh, Le Corbusier. And, uh, and uh, I have a text here, which I found on the web about, uh, you know, the relationship, so to speak, between him and, and, and Le Corbusier. As I said, he was very influenced by Le Corbusier. Here he is with uh, his wife, perhaps, uh, and uh, with an interesting hat. Leonardo Sabioli, born in Florence on the 30th of March, but he died on May 11th. And that's the reason we talk about him today, because today is, the, is May 11th. In 1982, he died. Unfortunately, on week, there is no English uh, uh, Wikipedia entry on Leonardo Savioli. So I took, I took some text in Italian from the, the Italian Wikipedia. Uh, sorry about this. I don't know Italian, but it's not difficult to understand for uh, someone from Romania what is written in Italian. So Leonardo Savioli was born in 1917. Uh, on the 30th of March. And what else is written here? Leonardo, I shouldn't uh, ridicule myself by uh, trying to read in Italian, although it's very tempting because it's a beautiful language. And even if I don't know it, I, I, I still enjoy uh, reading it. So let's try. Leonardo Savioli nasce a Firenze nel, I can do it in Italian. Nel, I can do it, consegue la maturità classica e si iscrive alla facoltà di architettura dell'Università di Firenze. Uh, from 1941, si laurea discutendo... No, I should stop. I'm totally ridiculous. But you can see a few names there, including Leonardo Ricci, with whom he created a few interesting buildings. And... Uh, I don't even know why I put this text here. I should, I, I, it was my intention to translate it into English, but I had no time to do so. So I move forward, but we'll have, we'll have, uh, we'll have some, some more text in English about him and Le Corbusier. Uh, just a second. First, we look at some drawings by him. And unfortunately, I only found very low resolution uh, images, but I, I chose to keep them although they are unsatisfying because of their dimensions. Um, as I said, he was also a painter, not just an architect. And uh, about this, we are going to read very soon. About this and Le Corbusier, who also was a painter as well. This drawing, though, by him, Crocifissione, uh, Crucifixion, I imagine, uh, is, is very beautiful and very unsettling in a way. You know, it's abstract, but it's, 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 it's labyrinthical, it's uh, tormented, and uh, it's a very good drawing, I think. But maybe I, I made this statement because it matches some of my aesthetical interests and as such, you know, subjectively, I declare it as, as being a, a, a very nice drawing. I think it is. But let's read a little bit about him and Le Corbusier. The meeting of Leonardo Savioli with Le Corbusier is undoubtedly one of those that the Florentine architect, meaning Savioli, defines as fatal. In other words, decisive, illuminating, necessary. 
Among the specific occasions for the meeting of the two architects, two stand out. The first in 1948 and the second in 1963. So the meeting between uh, Savioli and Le Corbusier. The importance of the second episode appears as decisive in many traces of the university lectures given by Savioli at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Florence between the years 1966 and 1970, when he was more than 50 years old. We remember he was born in 1917. Of this later, uh, later encounter, the architect remembers in particular the episode in which Le Corbusier confesses that he would have liked to become a painter, to which Savioli adds. Naturally, I meditated for a long time on this phrase. L.C., meaning Le Corbusier, wanted to be only a painter and had made me think of Le Corbusier's painting, architecture, and sculpture. Because yes, this was also the dream of Walter Gropius to bring together painting, sculpture, and architecture in the act of building. The words of, on Le Corbusier that Leonardo Savioli addressed to his students when he gave lectures read today of, offer a double interpretation. The text was written by someone. Savioli speaks of Le Corbusier, but indirectly talks about himself. These are the lectures given by an architect who is also an active painter, who was, and who in an analyzing the works of an undisputed master carries out a sort of indirect apology of his own work. The point of view of Saviola on Le Corbusier is therefore biased and directly directed towards a critical interpretation that is triggered by the need to find confirmation of his own work. Savioli focuses the attention on, of his students on the relationship of osmosis between painting and architecture that took place in the master, meaning Le Corbusier, and yet is indirectly speaking of that same relationship of osmosis between painting and architecture we take, which takes place on a daily basis in his own work through the practice of drawing. It is not only the structure that underlies all the arts, it is also what unites them. For Savioli, drawing is much more. It is projection. It is the ever operating necessity to design. It is the connecting tissue of existence itself and reflects its transformations. Thus, the lectures on Le Corbusier gravitate essentially around the same thematic nucleus that constitutes the essence of the work of Savioli. The possibility of a fertile relationship between the arts, not in the historicized time of historical artistic criticism, but in contemporary culture itself, in, in the time in which to quote, a painting is always less than a, less of a painting and the building is always less of a building. This is a, an intriguing, in, intriguing uh, ending of this text. Maybe we should talk about this at the end of the presentation. This is the website that I took this um, text from. And uh, let's look at some of his built work. Uh, a market. Uh, Pescia, 1948, 1951. So immediately after the war, together with the other Leonardo, not Leonardo da Vinci, but Leonardo Ricci. And it's a, it's a brilliant uh, structure here that is floating uh, uh, very elegantly uh, and yet stable. It's a fine work by uh, Savioli and Ricci. Not very well kept, but uh, uh, it's brilliant in terms of, uh, you know, a, a structure which refuses to be just structure. Because it is cultural, it is uh, emotional, it is expressive. And here it is, uh, you know, used by, uh, by vendors.
you could say, what's the use of, of such a you know sophisticated structure, uh, you know, in the context of a banal market? No, I, I think it does matter. I mean, if I am to think of the library <clears throat> Saint Genevieve, so or the reading room at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris by uh, Henri Labrust, and I look here at the ceiling or the roofing that uh, Savioli and Ricci made for this market, in a way, is the same spirit. Even though here people do not buy knowledge, but they buy products. But it's okay. It's still about you know, uh, emphasizing the, the immeasurable quality of life. Even if you buy, when you go there to buy, I don't know what, vegetables or uh, uh, meat or whatever. And this is the, the you know, the, the project, the, the plan and the section and the elevation, the long elevation of the building. Savioli and Ricci. and the beautiful blue sky with some clouds of Tuscany. Mercati dei Fiori a Pescia. Now his own house, Casa Labio Savioli, uh, in the proximity of, uh, of Firenze, from 19, or Florence, 1950, 1952, a very modest, well, a modest house. The influence of, of Le Corbusier on his work at uh, times is very, very obvious, and we are going to see uh, such, such examples very soon. But this must be the room of an architect, no? Well, yes, an architect also paints or painted. I wanted to show also the house that Leonardo Ricci, his uh, partner in several projects, built for himself, because it would be interesting to compare the two houses. Now, maybe Leonardo Ricci had more money than uh, Leonardo Savioli, it's possible, because his house is, 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 is bigger and uh, more dramatic, but it's, a, it's, an excellent, uh, it's an excellent building. La Casa Studio di Leonardo Ricci. And here it is in a, in a I would say in a dramatic, uh, uh, you know, landscape. And I like very much what I see here, you know, a stone wall. And then we see, you know, rather unusual uh, windows, you know, with these verticals and an artwork here and, uh, you know, some kind of a bristle system in concrete and uh, exposed concrete. Both architects worked with the, within what is called the new brutalism. But here you see everything infused with the, with the culture, with the spirit, with the sensitivity of, of Florence and Tuscany. You know, it's, it, it would be difficult to imagine this building, let's say, in the United States or Australia. It is in Italy. It is in the proximity of Florence, or if not in Florence, actually, I should read. When Fiesole, I guess it's maybe a suburb of, of Florence. Excellent building by uh, Leonardo Ricci. It's inspiring, you know, because there is the, you know, the tactility, the tectonics of stone, the rawness and the earth, earthiness of stone. And then, of course, is the sloping uh, land and the 
the great trees, and then you have art here, you see, and it's, it's just this meeting between the earth and the sky, between the, the earth and the sky of art, if I am to allow to say something like this, and you have the raw concrete, and then you have the, the, the sculpture, and you have the, the glass treated clearly in a modernistic way. It's, it's, it's a very fine melange, and uh, uh, it's romantic, it's powerful, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a building that uh, encourages you to hope that it's possible to somehow create uh, an harmony between man and nature, between culture and nature. Now, I like this building very much. Leonardo Ricci, though, not Leonardo Savioli. But we are going to see a few more buildings by Leonardo Savioli. Leonardo Ricci lived a little, a little longer. I think he died at 76, while his friend died at 66, 67. Now, with such trees around, uh, although I should not underestimate architects, architects could make a very ugly building even in the vicinity of such glorious trees. <laughs> Villa Torelli from 1954 in Florence. Here he collaborated with someone, he collaborated with several architects. Leonardo Ricci was one, this is another one, Danilo Santi. So 1954, Edifici per Appartamenti, Ville, Mercato, Coperto, anyway. Uh, I don't know why I have this here. And I think, I don't have, no, I should have pictures with the, we move forward. Something is wrong here. As I told you, I had to recreate, not that I tried to excuse myself, but in a hurry, I had to make another poem, poem presentation, PowerPoint presentation with uh, Leonardo Savioli. Villa Ghiandaia in Florence, no pictures. Villa Sandroni in Arezzo, in collaborazione con Danilo Santi. Uh, an opulent uh, villa. I couldn't find uh, great pictures. This one is also a little bit foggy, and this one is too small. I have some pictures of the model of this house. Um, it's a model. It's possible it was not, uh, you know, photographers were not allowed inside the building, being, being a, a private property. But we see here elements that are uh, not to be ignored. You know, the filtering of light through a wall which refuses to be a barrier between the outside and the inside. And the gentleness of the wooden elements that uh, uh, bring uh, necessary sensitivity to the, to the wall and thus to the building. And there is complexity here now. It's not a simplistic uh, architecture. I mean, you see, even the columns and the beams, they, they, they uh, you know, there is an uh, architect architecturalization of them. You know, they are not left uh, just with uh, what the engineer says is necessary. They are treated aesthetically, even if with very simple means. Again, this is the model. It's too bad I, I couldn't find pictures of the building as it was built. These are the plans, more recent drawings, digital drawings, that is. A large building, as you can see. Leonardo Savioli.
Anyway, in the absence of the natural landscape, uh, these drawings are abstract and uh, devoid of something, maybe devoid of life. And being digital drawings, uh, maybe particularly so, maybe. Another villa, yes, Villa Tadei, San Domenico a Firenze, again with Danilo Santi and another architect, S. Fabri, 1964. And this is a dramatic villa, clearly inspired by Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier also used to have this kind of stair, you know, with a parapet only on one side. In fact, there is a very amusing uh, picture with Le Corbusier visiting uh, a building he built in Ahmedabad in India, where he walks with his back to the parapet, almost obviously, uh, or maybe without almost, uh, afraid not to fall. And behind him, the young uh, B.V. Doshi, uh, who seemed to be alert in case something happened to the master and had vertigo not to fall. Well, in the, in the building in Ahmedabad, what is strange is that, uh, well, and this happened also at the, at the at Ronchamp. There is a stair uh, in the back of the building, if we have to call it so, the back of the building, where the, uh, you know, the, the rail, the handrail is close to the wall, but not on the side which is really dangerous, you know, like the outside, you know, the exterior, like here, like exactly like in this case. So maybe this stair done in uh, exposed concrete uh, is uh, Nietzsche in his spirit, inspired by Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, live dangerously. You know, now this, the danger is not, cardinal is not crucial, is not huge. If you fall, you fall from a few meters, but still, <laughs> still, it's something to reflect on because obviously orthodox functionalism would protest such a step, you know, because yes, something could happen and uh, you could fall. But maybe exactly this fact that the, the stair uh, seems to suggest a certain level of a certain, a certain degree of danger, it becomes uh, powerful aesthetically. As for the building as a whole, it's very much uh, Leonardo Savioli, but the influence of, of, uh, of the master uh, Le Corbusier is, is to be seen. Maybe you know, Frank Lloyd White was not highly seduced by concrete. He called concrete a conglomerate and didn't use it very often. He did use it, but in his uh, particular way, like in the four textile houses he built in California, uh, otherwise rather reluctantly he used concrete. Not so with Le Corbusier and not so with uh, Leonardo Savioli. But uh, you see here the concrete in its uh, rawness has plastic virtues, has aesthetical virtues. Leonardo Sabioli. An eclectic, uh, uh, you know, assemblage of uh, furniture here probably not he chosen by him. Sorry about the resolution of this picture. And actually I have all the, here, all, all the project is here. A little bit hard to see, but it's still uh, an opulent, a big villa uh, that uh, Savioli again built. So he was called an architect of the new brutalism. I don't know exactly what that new brut brutalism means, but I guess we could approximate that yes, his work has some elements of what was called brutalism. 
Although I think he, being also a painter and an artist, he uh, softened uh, brutalism with elements of uh, uh, aesthetical uh, grace. And uh, we, we saw, for example, in this picture here, you know, I mean, look, there are certain complexities, even the way he treated the glass uh, that, that softened, you know, the, what could be raw in a, an exposed concrete. Even the fact that the, the concrete is uh, uh, showing, you know, the usage of uh, uh, wooden elements, these horizontal uh, parts of the making of the concrete actually add to the um, sensibilization of the concrete. Leonardo Savioli. Now another important building by him, a, a block of flats, an apartment building in Florence, again with Danilo Santi, 1964-1967, is this one. Not bad, we have to confess, not bad. I mean, how many apartment buildings in the world look like this? And I, I would say here that uh, a very important role is played by the windows. You know, these small windows that he plays with in a very, you know, uh, ludic way. And I mean, how else could you play? Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the shutters of the windows and, uh, you know, with, with wooden elements. And, and the fact is there is a variety of windows but this is trying to describe uh, something which is uh, essentially subtle and uh, immeasurable in the creative process. The truth is, is a building that is uh, unique and uh, sculptural and, you know, uh, it has individuality. And this is not easy in Florence. Uh, an architect from Florence told me many years ago that it's very, very difficult to produce a modern architecture in Florence because of its magnificent, uh, uh, you know, uh, Renaissance culture. And, uh, you know, in a city like Florence to bring the new in a, in a convincing way is not easy at all. But let's not forget, and actually I didn't mention, uh, Savioli studied architecture with uh, Giovanni Michelucci, who himself built interesting things in Florence and near Florence, like uh, the church of the of the uh, of the highway. Uh, that's that's how it is called. If you visit Florence and you try to go, let's say, by bus from Florence to Mantua, you'll pass by an incredible cathedral or church that was built by Giovanni Michelucci, also with a lot of exposed concrete. Giovanni Michelucci was a great Italian architect, who was the professor who, with whom uh, Leonardo Savioli studied. And, uh, you know, again, studying with such a master like Michelucci, besides the influence of Le Corbusier, gave Leonardo Savioli the courage to be creative and modern in a city with such a, with such a history, cultural history like Florence. Bravo to him. I mean, you see the buildings on the left and on the right, and then all of a sudden, this building by Savioli. The model again. Now, who said that architecture is not an art? 
But if it was an art, if it was not an art, you know, first of all, architecture would not be present in all histories of art. And second, you know, by the way of Leonardo Savioli, he could not have done what he did. There is artistry here. What else is there, if not artistry, in manipulating, you know, the functions and the forms in this way and to create a building which is, you know, impressive, which is uh, interesting, is enticing, exciting, convincing aesthetically and standing and, you know, ready to be used. It, it, it is about being, as Walter Gropius would say, exalted, because again, in his manifesto for the Bauhaus uh, founding, Gropius said that the only difference between an artist and a craftsman is that the artist is an exalted craftsman. And it is this exaltation that made Savioli play with the windows in this way and create a, a sculpture which is inhabited but it, which is more than a sculpture because it's a building, it's an architecture. But it's an architecture which also assumes sensitivity and aesthetics and thus art. Uh, why did he do this, the roofing like this? He could have done it flat, no? It was more expensive like this. But, you know, not just ladies, but men too, including himself, sported, uh, you know, certain hats. You know, a hat needs a hat sometimes, and not just because of the rain or the snow. A building too needs a coiffure and a, and a hat sometimes. Here we see a special hat for this building. Yes, it was more expensive than a flat terrace with or without jardin. But, you know, if you make a building, uh, perhaps uh, you can uh, legitimize uh, a certain expenditure for something that is important. And that is the, the ending of the building in its way upwards towards the sky. You see here too, it's crucial that top part, the head of the building, it, 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 it exalts. It's a very fine apartment building. And it needed an artist to do this. That is an exalted craftsman, not just a craftsman. Remember Paul Valéry to make the stones sing. And this building, in my opinion, does sing. In a way, it's the same exaltation that we witnessed at the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve in Paris by Labrust, or the reading room again by Labrust at the Bibliothèque Nationale, where the top part of the room and here the top part of the building play a crucial role. Why are there hair salons? Why do people go? Because because it is important, you know, the, the top part of a human being to have a certain, you know, a certain look, a certain coiffure, a certain haircut. People say a nice haircut. Well, do we think about the haircuts of our buildings? I don't think we, we do it often enough. What if we say at one point, passing by on the street and say, hey, here is a building with a beautiful haircut or with a beautiful coiffure or with a beautiful hat. The playfulness of the windows. Some large, some small, all delicious. It's a symphonic work and this is the plan.
It's an organic machine to, a, to an extent. I mean, look, just in, just just playing with the openings in the wall, with the windows, he creates an architectural event right here. It's one unit, but look at the look at the differentiation between the between the windows. So it is, it is possible to bring modernity to Florence without insulting in any way the glorious past. In fact, adding to it. In other words, what Savioli did here, he whispered to the great Renaissance culture of this city, we can do equally well. And he did in the present, in modernity. Another interesting building, Villa Bayon, San Gaggio in Florence, 1965-1972. Here, maybe the influence of Le Corbusier is even more apparent. I, I always had in my mind when I looked at pictures of this building, uh, Ronchamp. Uh, this, this is the, the long uh, facade. Uh, it, it's again, again, and again, he considers very emphatically the top part of the building, the roof. And the roof is emphatic. But maybe it is supposed to be emphatic. Let's think of Chambord with the incredible, absolutely incredible mini Manhattan on top of the, of the chateau uh, makes it, uh, you know, rubbishy. I was there, I know what I'm saying. The chimneys, you know, uh, of, of, of Chambord are, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving one wings. And here we see again the top part of the building uh, playing a dramatic role, a sculptural role. How is it called this building? Villa Bayon, Villa Bayon, 1965-1972. The strict functionalists would protest, would say it's a loss of money, it's a loss of materials, it's a loss of patience and time and whatever. No, no, if you do a building, you try to do it architecture. You try to be an Eupalinos. And if you are not an Eupalinos, you are not an architect. Interesting, interesting work. We have to acknowledge it. I wonder at what Andrea Palladio would have said about it. Because it is so different from the buildings by Palladio. But is it? Maybe in a certain way it is not. I wonder what someone who enters this building through here feels. Villa Bayon, il new brutalism, brutalism, there is an S there which shouldn't be there, di Leonardo Savioli. A, a bridge in Florence, 1967, rather elegant in its, in its uh, almost minimalist uh, simplicity, I mean, you look at the buildings in the background and you look at the bridge and the bridge is uh, 
it has a different character. It's, it's modern, it's fresh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's good even for our time, while the buildings in the background are dated. Now, another interesting work with Leonardo Ricci, a housing complex, rather complex, this housing complex from 1957 to 1980. So 23 years. Here it is. And again and again, we see the top part of the building assuming an emphasis, which is probably very important in architecture in general. Now, in front of the building, there are the garbage containers. What can we do? We produce in order to consume. And after we consume, we produce, or through consuming, through consume, we produce a lot of garbage. So it is unavoidable to have uh, garbage collectors. But the building is, uh, the buildings, because there are several buildings, are uh, dramatic. Is there a need for them to be dramatic? Well, again, if you want to be an Eupalinos or an architect, it is probably a good thing to assume a certain drama, you know, formal drama, sculptural drama. Uh, I, I like to imagine that someone who lives in this building you know, is, uh, has a certain pride because of living in a building that is not like all the others. It's, it has its own personality. It has character. Leonardo Savioli and Leonardo Ricci. Uh, this building could have been very, very common, very pedestrian, and is not, and is not exactly because of the subjectivity and the capriciousness of certain architectural elements that Leonardo Savioli and Leonardo Ricci indulge themselves in. Uh, how, if this part which seems to be useless in terms of uh, strict functionalism was absent, the building would have been much more banal. And then if we cut these extensions of this corridor or balcony, it's probably a corridor for access in apartments, it would have been even more banal and so on. If we, if we, if we eliminate the unnecessary elements, we actually lose. So it's very possible that uh, John Ruskin was correct. The most beautiful things in life and in nature are those that are the most useless, like the tail of the peacock and the lily. Here also, the, the elements that, that add to architecture and in fact transform the building into architecture are the most useless. But beauty is not useless. Sculpturalness is not useless. Well, it's the rendering of the project, but unfortunately the resolution is not great, sorry. And it might be that this is the last picture of this imperfect and rather short presentation of an interesting architect. Um, Leonardo Savioli, and here we see in this picture again, the emphasis he placed on the top part of the building. You know, here is the drama. 
There are some good, interesting things uh, below as well. But at the top, we have the drama. Uh, at the top, we have the tail of the peacock. It was not the last picture, but we are getting closer. And again, with the same message, that at the top, the building becomes interesting or more interesting. The haircut of the, of the building, the coiffure of the building. That's the back of the building, a little bit less glorious, but now look at this balcony here. Did it need to be so emphatic to be so, you know, moving uh, outwards, uh, so uh, dramatic in terms of a strict functionalism? It didn't need it. But in terms of architectonic expression, it did need it. Because through this individual solitary balcony is expressed probably the longing, the aspiration of all the building in this building and other buildings and maybe the city itself. It's a symbol of wanting to aspire towards the immeasurable. If I am to sound maybe a little too dramatic or too... Uh, you know, uh, rhetorical, but how else to express, you know, the, the dimensions of this balcony and, and, and you know, and the architectonic, um, you know, uh, the, the architectonic uh, configuration. And it's the same thing with what happens at the top. So again and again, it's very possible that John Ruskin was correct. The most beautiful things in life and in nature are those that are the most useless. I mean, is this collecting water here? This makes me think of a library that Arata Isozaki built in the 50s in, in Japan. But there, there was a, some kind of an expression of a metabolic or metabolistic architecture. Here, I don't know exactly what the function of this, um, you know, tunnel is. Here, I understand, you know, they, uh, well, uh, I don't know, but I imagine they, you know, externalize water that, that, that falls on the, on, the, on, the, on the top of the building. But here, and yet, again and again, these elements which have a, a questionable, uh, uh, um, you know, functionality are the most interesting, uh, visually, aesthetically, architectonically, or architecturally. Thank you. <laughs>